Welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great honor of speaking with my very good friend, Douglas Tiger, fellow of the AIA. His name resonates with innovation, leadership, and an unwavering commitment to a balanced and holistic approach to running an architecture practice, the practice of architecture, and life. Doug's illustrious career began upon his graduation from Cornell University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Architecture. Just seven years later, he embarked on the bold venture of establishing his own firm. Under his visionary leadership, what started as a solo practice flourished into a thriving firm of 32 professionals, each driven by the same passion and dedication that Douglas himself embodies. In 2009, Douglas sought to broaden his horizons and deepen his understanding of the human experience by earning a master's degree in spiritual psychology from the University of Santa Monica. This unique educational pursuit enriched his professional practice, imbuing his firm with a culture that values balance, well-being, and a holistic approach to both work and life. His innovative strategies and operations optimization have notably allowed for more time to be dedicated to design and project research, a testament to his forward-thinking approach. Douglas's influence extends well beyond the walls of his own firm. In 2017, he brought his visionary leadership to the AIA Los Angeles chapter as its president and contributed significantly to the AIA National Strategic Council. His roles in these esteemed bodies highlight his dedication to advancing the profession and shaping the strategic direction of the architectural community. In 2019, Douglas transitioned from his firm, handing the reins to three capable associates and launched Tiger Consulting. His new venture allows him to focus on coaching, consulting and personal growth, continuing his mission to live an inspired, balanced life. His philosophy is not just a personal mantra, but a professional ethos that he imparts to his clients and colleagues alike. Outside the realm of architecture, Doug's life is a tapestry of family, painting and sports, all of which reflect his belief in a well-rounded, fulfilling life. His journey is a shining example of excellence, continuous learning and the pursuit of a balanced approach to both personal and professional endeavours. Now, Doug is, over the years, has become a very good friend of mine. I love and enjoy speaking with him and spending time with him and just really appreciate his insights, what he's doing for the architecture industry and just who he's being as a, as an inspiration, as a mentor, as someone who's wise uh, and has an enormous amount to share with the architectural community uh, and to the consulting and coaching community. So in this episode, Doug and myself, we discuss being authentic in your leadership. We speak about honoring your commitments and accountability. And we talk about you having the freedom to choose your attitude and to work and to be in alignment with your core values. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the magnificent Douglas Tiger. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Douglas, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? been great thanks for having me back what an absolute pleasure always a delight to be speaking with you now you are in the same world as i am you're an architect you've uh you you managed and um owned a very successful practice in los angeles which you've now sold your equity in and have become a business consultant a business coach um, with a very deep kind of philosophy, if you like, of a, a very human approach to running a business, which I resonate very much with. And you and I, we've spent 
many hours talking with each other and sharing ideas and and things and I feel like we're very you know very aligned in that sense and it's and it's a pleasure to have you on the show thank you um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the work that you do with your with your clients how you help them um and perhaps we'll just jump in there really with uh, if you were to describe what it is that you do with clients how would you explain it to somebody oh you know it, it, it's interesting i was going to start with the concept that it's all about a work-life balance hmm. but i read a quote that there's no such thing as a work-life balance it's just life and i try to help my clients achieve the life that they want now not what it's going to be in the future like mm -hmm. once i build the business then i can enjoy there is no gold at the end of the rainbow. So I always use the analogy in the quest for the Holy Grail that the quest is the grail. Mm -hmm. There was no grail at the end of the quest. Yeah. So to try to have the mindset that this journey that we call life, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, for myself, has always lived in the future. When I was um, in high school, I wanted to get to college. When I got to college, I finished in four years because I wanted to get out and work. When I was working, it was be, I'll be happy when I have my own firm. When I had my own firm, I'll be happy when I'm married. When I'm married, I'll be happy when I have kids. When I had kids, I'll be happy when they're out of the house, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I was so living in the future that I'll be happy when. And I try to help my clients understand that what is the practice that we want to create today? Mm -hmm. And what are the values that we want to live by that we can just enjoy now? Because mm -hmm. that's all there is. And only when I went through my master's in spiritual psychology did I shift that mindset. Mm -hmm. And even being a type A personality, I constantly love to do and it's hard to just be. I'm realizing that that ability to be so grateful for what we have that the now is great. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, you know, if we think about it, we have a house over our head, we have food to eat, we have clothing, we are, we have friends, we are so blessed. And if you're the firm owner or working for a firm, you have a great opportunity to contribute something meaningful. That's all something to be grateful for. So it's, it's, um, it's helping my firms create the life they want now, not in the future. A very wisdom-based approach. I, I think that's very, uh, yeah, it's a very wise words that you're saying there. And I mean, I speak to lots of architects and it's easy to get caught up in the doing, 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 being busy. I sometimes refer to what happens to us um, as human, we become human doings yeah. and we forget the being the human being. And, it, yeah, I and, love that. and, and, and you, you put it beautifully, like we get caught up in the, the relentless pursuit of a goal as opposed to using the goal as a North star with which is a aid to help us focus on the path that we're treading today. And that's where a goal can become very, very powerful. Yeah. With with your clients, what do you feel is, are some of the things that they're the biggest challenges that you know that a lead to this conflict, if you like, with being pulled into future results or pursuit of future results, and then being residing comfortably in the now? Yeah. So I think part of that is being clear on what I want. Mm and being able to ask for what I want, to ask for, I wanna have a balanced life. You know, a lot of us don't ask for that or are not clear on what we really want. And I, I believe the foundation of everything is really clear communication. And it starts with yourself. Are you clear with what you want? Are you clear with what your goals are? Are you clear with, um, the type of relationship you want, the type of firm you want. Are you clear with setting your core values, setting your intention of what is the office that I want to create? 
So it's it's that ability to um, ask for what you want and to know what you want, and are you in alignment with that? Mm -hmm. Does knowing and, what you want? How, how does knowing what you want evolve as a process? How do you help people begin that inquiry? Being curious, you know, just asking questions. It's, it's um, you know, one exercise we used in our program was to create an ideal scene. And an ideal scene is a very simple exercise on the piece of paper. It started with a heart in the middle and had the words, I am. And we just do um, uh, uh, lines emanating from that I am speaking in the present moment with a lot of descriptors. I am joyfully going to work each day doing amazing projects. I am attracting creative clients wanting creative solutions. I am hiring the most talented people to be part of this team. Mm -hmm. I am joyfully um, mentoring all my staff. I am lovingly communicating with my clients. It's creating the ideal. I, I, um, I have a light-filled office um, on, on Main Street. Whatever the descriptor is, ask for what you want. Create mm -hmm. the ideal scene of what you want. This can be an ideal scene for um, the clients that you attract, for the office that you're in, for the type of work that you're doing. And this ties back to the power of words, power of thought, power of intention. If you put it out there, if you write it down, a strategic plan, a business plan is no more than writing down what you want, writing down what you want to achieve. And when we've done that, I mean, five years later, I look back and it's like, oh my God, we achieved it. So it's that same intentionality of just documenting and being clear on what, what you want. Yeah. Even my wife and I, for where we live now, you know, we recently moved to uh, Ojai and we created an ideal scene of what we wanted and we got it. Mm -hmm. You've been here. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Amazing. And it's yeah. very interesting. You, you're drawing to attention as well, language, how important language is in this, being able to define what it was you want. And the exercise that you just outlined there, what draws my attention. Um, my attention is that you're using very specific adjectives like lovingly or excitedly or passionately or yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the, about the specifics of the language that you're encouraging people to use when creating these ideations or these idealized, um, so the, the concept is you want to create the feeling mm -hmm. of what you want. So it's not just, I want to, I want a large office. You know, what is the feeling that you want from that office? And the adjectives can help you move into that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's more than just an intellectual consideration. Yes, it's energetic. It's the energetic feeling of what it's like to be in that, whatever you're trying to create. Amazing. So how do people know that what they want is, A, it's really what they want, and B, I'll often speak with people and the, the just asking what is it that you want can suddenly bring up a lot of resistance. There can, the people are very good at least defining what they don't want. And, that, yes, that's and I was going to mention that, that that's very important. The universe doesn't understand the negative. So if you say what you don't want, it's going to give you that. It's not going <laughs> to not give you that. So when you do this exercise, you're always speaking in the positive of what you want, not what you don't want. So I don't want cheap clients. It's going to bring you cheap clients. It doesn't understand the negative. So I want wealthy, creative clients who are enthusiastically um, presenting and, and co-creating this project with me or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the word is, make it your... There, 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 there's a, um, a saying that I love. If you're going to have a future fantasy, at least win in it. 
So if we're going to project into the future, let's win in our own future fantasy. I personally have suffered from creating so many negative future fantasies. A client calls and I'm thinking, oh my God, what's, you know, I, I project the worst of what's going to happen. Not he's going to say, oh my God, Doug, thank you so much. That was an amazing solution. I'm thinking, oh, you know, did I not hit it right? Is he upset with something? How quickly we go to the negative rather than the positive. Mm -hmm. So likewise, in these ideal scenes, always state the positive. And if you're going to have a future fantasy, at least win in your own future fantasy. So it, I, I find that quite an interesting concept about how the mind um, can kind of fixate on things that we don't want. And then unintentionally, we're creating more of what it is that we don't want because our, all of our energetic you know, focus is being applied onto this, you know, thing that we just want to get away from I've, I've heard people in the past liken it to you know it's kind of you hear of these car crashes that happen and somebody crashes into the only tree for 16 miles around because they start looking at the one thing that they don't want to hit and so true i mean that that applies um for skiing when you do ski through the trees you have right. to focus on the opening <laughs> yeah right so or motorcycles you 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 drive to where, where you're looking so look for the positive, look for the opening, look for the solution. And you'll be amazed at, at what happens over time. And so how do you like, how do you kind of wedge people open to allow them to ask for what, number one, ask for what they want. And number two, have, because there's a lot of courage in asking for what you want. Yes. Yes. And, and, and it's, it, we can underestimate that as well. It sounds like it's quite an obvious thing to do, but actually a lot of times we've got, we've got trauma in not having, you know, in getting what we don't want. And we've got past experience of asking for what we wanted once before and then disappointment. So how do you make it safe for people to dream and to have courage to ask for what it is that they want? My, my wife has a, a line she always uses on me, so... So how is that working for you? <laughs> so life is just an experiment. You know, if it's working, keep it. Great. If it's not working, something has to change to make a change. Mm -hmm. So do you want to stay in the pattern that you're in? Or do you want to be curious and just experiment? Life is just an experiment. So let's try something new. I'm constantly just saying, let's experiment. Let's do it for three months. I don't know if it's going to work or not. And once again, I'm never telling my firms or my clients what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, hey, let's look at different ideas. Let's find what's in alignment for you. And then let's test it. It's just an experience. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole life is just a series of experiences. Mm -hmm. So let's just test, try and keep it or try something else. I like that. And, you know, there's often, um, it, when posed with the question, what it is that you want, people can kind of clam up, if you like, with being fearful. It's like they've only got one wish with the genie. <laughs> so I, what do you want today? You know, it can be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's um, let's just play with something. Yeah. And here's, here's, I think, one of the challenges for design firms or architecture firms, engineering. I mean, all the... AEC type service industry firms. We only have so many at bat opportunities. And the analogy I'm using is like baseball or Little League or coaching my kids through Little League. You only get better when you have hundreds of chances to practice. In architecture, we only do proposals two a month, three a month. Mm -hmm. That is not a lot of practice. I mean, some firms do one proposal a month. That's 12 a year. Are you going to get better at baseball with 12 swings at a ball? No. You know, so how do we practice? And I constantly say in terms of the, you know, using the proposal as an example, videotape tape yourself. Present to your friend. Videotape it. Present to, you know, family members, whatever, to get practice of how are you communicating and sharing and telling your story, your way of doing it, your way of selling or communicating. Mm -hmm. I don't even like the word selling. It's really, how are you communicating and sharing your story? Mm -hmm. And by sharing your story and the value you bring is why someone's going to hire you. 
but we need we need opportunity. We need you know what's that famous Zen saying? You know, ten thousand ten thousand hours, uh, you become a master after ten thousand hours. Mm-hmm. How many hours are we putting in presenting proposals, presenting schemes? I mean, it's so it's minor. Mm-hmm. So, in the practice, let's look at a kind of CEO of an architecture firm, and you've warmed them up. They've had the courage to dream a little bit and to actually start to commit something down in, you know, here, here's, they're starting to craft where it is they want to go and what it is that they want. What are some of the most common obstacles to those goals that you see firm owners dealing with? Interesting. I'm going to throw it back to you. What, what have you found? Let me hear what you're thinking and uh, I'll see what others can be there. You know, it's, um, I think fear is a big part. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, it comes down to, we all have an inner voice in our head. Mm -hmm. So if we get on a spiritual level, I believe there, we are divine beings using this human experience. Mm -hmm. As divine beings, the spark inside of us that is divine is from the oneness. And the analogy I use is the ocean. If we take a cup of water out of the ocean, that's still the ocean. Yeah. The cup is our vessel. So I think of ourselves as consciousness connected to the whole. Our body is the vessel. When we go, it all goes back to consciousness. So from that perspective, that is the inner spark. In addition, we have an ego. The ego is a inner voice that is either going to be a cheerleader or a critic, typically a Mm -hmm. cheerleader or a critic, if I were going to simplify it. The sole purpose of the ego is to keep, is to help us survive. It's going to do anything possible to help us survive. Some of those inner voices, um, and I found for most creatives, I feel the inner voice is more of a critic than a cheerleader. For those of you that your inner voice is a cheerleader, that's fantastic. But I have found most creatives, the inner voice is a critic. You could do more. You could do better. You could do it again. You know, let's push harder. Let's, you know, it's, it's, that's not good enough. I mean, let's do another version. Mm -hmm. It's always that, that critical voice versus, oh my God, that is a brilliant idea. You know, let's just explore a little bit. I mean, it's very different, those two voices. Yeah. So I think helping the, um, um, helping my clients become aware that when that critic voice is coming up to be able to pause and say, Hey, that has served me really well up until now, but let's shift that. And let's just say, let's try something different. And I talk about four levels of consciousness. There's unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, Mm -hmm. conscious competence, and unconscious competence. So it's going through that progression when we're just not aware of that inner voice, when we're not aware of the patterns that have been going on inside of us, that's unconscious incompetence. When we can first become aware and catch ourselves, oh my God, that's my inner voice criticizing, or oh my God, that's a pattern that's holding me back. To be aware of that is conscious incompetence. Conscious competence is to take that inner voice and to be able to talk to it in the moment and to then shift right in that moment. But you're still thinking of that shift. So that's conscious competence. Mm -hmm. Unconscious competence is a professional athlete that is just in the flow. He's not thinking of what he's doing. It's just, he's just consciously competent. And when we can shift and just be aware that we're, we, we made a choice. That's the first step. And just to be able to listen to our thoughts. And, and that's part of meditation. I mean, meditation is not blocking your thoughts. I always talk about meditation as letting them come and letting them go. Being mm-hmm. the witness to just see what's going on, to have that awareness of the neutral observer almost outside of your head, to be looking in and saying, oh, my God, where did that thought come from? You know, what's the pattern? What's the thread if we carried that back to our childhood where that started from? 
And it's just beautiful to play with all of that. Yeah. So there's no one method of how do I work with clients? It's taking, I don't know if anyone remembers Felix the cat and he had his bag of tricks. I mean, an old cartoon from the sixties <laughs> is dating me, but it's having this bag of tricks mm -hmm. that we have to try different things with different people. And everyone hears something differently. Even if you go to the same lecture year after year, you're going to pick up something different from it. So everyone's ready at their own time to progress at their own level. That, that's very interesting. I, I would echo that sentiment about the kind of the challenges that I, I'll often see with, with people with their set their own goals. One is number one, actually being able to set a goal or define what it is that you want. And that takes some courage and it's an iterative process and, and immediately people are kind of met with internal resistance and hangups and not possible. And then the pursuit of the goal or the accomplishments of what they want, the, the immediate handbrake is often exactly what you're describing here. It's these unconscious paradigms, beliefs, the inner tyrant who comes out and criticizes and criticizes. And many people are, they love, they, they kind of allow the inner tyrant to run completely free. And many of us have been brought up in a, in a situation or with a childhood where tyranny of some form or another has been the way to produce a result. And we've kind of just learned that as a, as an internal mechanism, its intention is good. And I'll often kind of encourage people to look at the intention of it because these these characters of our psyche are often there trying to look after us. Yes, and, they are a hundred percent. And and they did something in the past and it worked once, and now they're trying to use the same old trick again and again and again. And actually, it's yeah. now operating like a handbrake. And, and, the, and I, the the other word I use is self sabotage. Right. You know, getting in our own way. Yeah. And it's interesting that many people are not aware of how we do this or are in denial that it's actually happening. And there could be like a, an aggressive pursuit of give me the systems, give me the, give me the tools. Those are all very powerful and, and useful, but they are underpinned by routines and disciplines to use the tools and routines and disciplines are underpinned by beliefs and paradigms and mindset and the, this, this reflective nature of being able to see your own subjective experience and the mechanisms of your own thinking, because that's really very, very, you know, it's so powerful when people start to recognize, you know, how am I relating to my team members? I'm constantly thinking about my team members and well, they're useless. They're, they're out of touch. This generation, it wasn't like this when I, that is a whole, it's now a big paradigm that you're interacting through people and they're they're locked into it now you know that good you know what was it like for them to kind of be trying to interact with you and all, and they're going to have their own picture of you in their minds not to put your baggage on them mm -hmm. so everything that's happened in my life up until now everything that's happened in everyone's life is creating a filter through the lens of which we look at everyone else so outer experience is a reflection of inner reality Outer experience, so what's happening outside of us, is just a reflection of how we're holding anything inside. The only mm. reality is what's inside of each of us. Everyone has a different reality. So if you can be as clear as you can and as loving as you can in your own inner reality, if you love yourself, it's going to be easier to love others. If you're hard on yourself, you're typically going to be hard on others. If you beat yourself up, you're going to beat up others. If you're a bully to yourself, you're going to be a bully to others. If you're in your loving, if you're grateful, if you're in gratitude and joy, if you're happy, you're going to see that in other people. So outer experience is a reflection of inner reality. So the healing has to occur in each of us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you have to do the work to heal that, that part of you that is holding on to a story that blames other people. If you blame other people, there's a part of you that's blaming yourself. So everything is, is just a mirror. It's just a reflection of what's going on inside of you. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very common 
thing that we'll see in the architecture practices and, and firm owners having either projecting their own insecurities onto team members. And it is, it is a complex, you know, um, dynamic in an architecture practice. And there is the expectation in an architecture practice of, you know, we're a profession, there is an element of mentoring that happens and people looking for guidance and stewardship. And there's, I mean, I, I really like that about architecture is that most architects are always quite happy to help younger members of the team. And there's a lot of fulfillment that comes from that. And I think that's a very yes. precious thing about the industry. But then there's also, you know, certainly in modern leadership that we're seeing like a, an ever increasing generational gap that can occur. Um, and you know, the perception of entitlement and this wasn't like that, this in, in my day, um, and practice owners being unnecessarily cruel, shall we say, um, and not knowing the difference between create, creating a culture of empowered accountability versus kind of punitive fear-based let's get something getting something done which is very corrosive to to a practice yes yes um so you brought up the concept of accountability mm -hmm. which i am seeing as a real issue with firm owners of how do we make the junior staff feel accountable mm -hmm. versus just a cog in the wheel or just not taking ownership of their work mm -hmm. and it's it's um i think it really comes from a culture of mentoring and education so it's up to the firm owner to really um be clear on what the expectations are and to really once again clear communication defining you know even when you hire them what does it mean to work at this company and mm -hmm. that even comes back to core values. I mean, the importance of core values is to really clarify, is this person a right fit to work for our office? And not everyone's going to be a right fit. Mm -hmm. If you are going to work on the, in this office, this is what we expect from everyone. And what does ownership look like? So ownership, it could be, and I think one of the best ways to help junior staff are to have checklists and systems in place so they know what is supposed to be on every sheet. What is the expectation of a floor plan? What's the expectation of, a, of, of an elevation? Mm -hmm. And to have a system that shows them this is what a schematic design looks like on all these sheets. Very, I, It's very interesting. We were doing an exercise not so long ago with some of the practice leaders in our, in our smart practice program. And everybody was complaining about entitled team members and we reversed the question over, a, over a, it was like a whole day long seminar that we were doing yeah. and we ended up reversing the question and ultimately we were getting people to look at well where am i entitled where yes, am i being, yes. where, where am i being entitled for me to be able to see everyone else as being entitled and it was so fascinating because it started to bring up some quite powerful revelations of people recognizing, well, actually, I'm very entitled in what I expect from these people who are working in my team and what they should and shouldn't be doing and how much they should be committed and how many hours they should be putting in. And, and actually, that entitlement is, is. is exactly what you're saying. It's that kind of reflecting of your inner, your inner world is now being projected onto other people. And sometimes when it's part of your own inner world that you haven't accepted or you're not familiar with or you 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 don't have good energy about let's put it that way then now we're getting frustration from our what we're perceiving as our external reality and then that breaks yeah, down I, communication th that is such a a universal truth of what you just said i mean typically when we see something negative in others it's because mm. we have an aspect of that inside ourselves. Mm. deep it's very deep yeah. so in in terms of accountability and kind of nurturing that as a culture, you're saying systems, processes, this is the kind of framework for for actually the, the, the tools for having it. What in terms of mentoring or coaching or like a leadership style, 
or a communication style do you think is very effective? You know, I, I think a communication style that is cu curious. I, I'm loving the word curious lately. So being curious, it's very different to ask, I'm curious why you chose this mm -hmm. versus that just doesn't work or mm -hmm. versus, you know, why'd you do it this way? Just mm -hmm. adding, I'm curious as to your, your thought mm -hmm. um, can shift the perception dramatically from someone being defensive to someone being excited to share with you why they thought this. Uh, so just phrasing it, you know, I'm curious what your thought was here mm -hmm. without any judgment. Now, once again, people can perceive the energetic feeling without the word, without using a judgmental word. So when you're saying, I'm curious, you have to be clean inside yourself. I have to be clean inside myself. So I'm not holding a negative energy that is coming across. So there's that famous uh, Japanese uh, doctor that did the water experiment where he wrapped bottles of water with different words. Mm -hmm. And then he froze the water crystals. And the bottles that were wrapped with positive words, you're beautiful, I love you, were beautiful crystals. And the words, the, 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 the crystals that were wrapped around words that were negative were, were deformed. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen that, just, just Google um, Japanese uh, water crystal study. It was brilliant. Do you know the one I'm referring to? Yes, yes, I've seen, I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I always tell my clients when you're writing an email, if you're angry, put it on pause because that mm. anger is going to come across energetically in the email. And when you communicate, if you're truly frustrated, pause, you know, go for a walk, shift. Because if you communicate from that place of that energetic place, whether you use the words or not, the other person is going to feel the energy. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. I mean, it's yeah. kind of, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about my myself here and sometimes, you know, how careful I have to be. Certainly if I'm recording something, that's why it was very nice before we started this, we had a little moment of silence and we had a had a, had a clearing and got connected that, you know, unconsciously we're bring, we're, we are, we're picking up all these frustrations. We've got these kind of mechanisms going around in our own, our own head and we can un, unintentionally just sort of be projecting them. And if we're recording and communicating or we have other people underneath our, our leadership, if you like, we can end up magnifying our own experience yes. unintentionally yeah. and certainly our insecurities. And, and again, it's kind of pointing back to the, the importance of real self-awareness and taking the time of, of reflection in your own leadership. And more and more we're seeing, you know, kind of contemporary writings on leadership and growth and success is it's, it's there. It's, it's yeah. always kind of pointing towards this maturity, if you like, this maturity of the leader to be right. self -aware. Almost a, a humanistic approach to leadership. It yes. really takes into account the emotional intelligence, I think, is so critical rather than just the skill set or the strictly intellectual approach versus the emotional approach. Yeah. So what does being authentic mean to you? We hear this phrase being used when it's talking in regards to leadership, like being authentic being authentic in our way that we're communicating. What does that mean for you? So authentic means in alignment with who I truly am. I mean, if you are sarcastic and you try to hide it, people are going to see right through it. So it's just really, I grew up East Coast, very preppy, very, very sarcastic. <laughs> and it took, and I realized in hindsight, after, you know, therapy in my twenties, that that was a separator mm -hmm. that pushed people away, that kept me distant and, you know, from not having more intimate conversations. And it was very hard to hide that. So it's only once I was able to heal that, 
I could have more intimate, honest, authentic, vulnerable conversations because I became a more vulnerable, authentic person. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working on that. I mean, I still don't always say what I want, say what I mean. I'm afraid of hurting other people. I'm afraid of not asking for what I want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a lifelong gro growing exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're all, we're all in this together. None of us are perfect. None of us have mastered this. Um, but it's just becoming aware when I do make a mistake, I can catch myself a lot quicker mm -hmm. and I'm still in different levels of those four levels of consciousness. You know, I still go unconscious at times and don't even know why I said that. And then other times I catch it in the moment and correct myself in the moment. Mm -hmm. And other times I make the right choice, not the right choice. I don't even want to use the word right or wrong. I, I make a choice that feels in alignment with who, with the person I want to be and the person I am. Yeah. 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 And I, I, think I think it's okay. I think it's okay to, to say, this is the person I want to be. It's okay to change mm -hmm. and to have an ideal leader, an ideal mentor, and to grow into those characteristics that you want to try to achieve. I think that's really, again, quite an enlightened approach to be able to, again, self-reflect, ask the question, what is my authentic self? Recognize that there are habitual ways of acting and being that we've picked up. Maybe they're, again, survival mechanisms. And, and I think what's interesting, like being sarcastic or having a sense of humor, that's something that we can very deeply identify with. Like we latch our entire personality onto that kind of trait. Well, that's just who I am. And if anybody else, you know, it takes a lot of skill to, for somebody, certainly an, an external person to kind of question you around that. And it takes a lot of courage for you to question it yourself and, and realize that's not, that's actually, that's a divider. That's actually keeping me. Right. That's um, not who I, that's not who I want to be. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it kind of comes back to this first question of, of, you know, what do you want? And underpinning that, what do you want is who do I want to be? Yes. Yes. And I, I, I am a living example of you can change from who you were to who you want to be in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not stuck with, you're not stuck as a person. Mm -hmm. We all evolve. We all can change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people say, oh, I can't change. He can't change. You know, they can't change. People can change. It's just making the effort if you really want to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this, actually, and, and with you uh, specifically, because I've known you for a while, and I've only known this version of Douglas. If you were to look back on how you used to, when you were practicing as an architect and as a, as a leader, what are you most impressed with in terms of how you've evolved and changed and things that you wouldn't I do I got, a lot, you did. I got a lot angrier in the past mm -hmm. and i would express that anger and the anger came out of frustration and my emotions i, I emoted my emotions and i'm not saying don't emote your emotions but i have fewer triggers mm -hmm. so in the past Everything triggered me, not everything. A lot of things triggered me in the past that I'm simply not triggered by now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even, uh, you know, big disappointments. It's okay, that happened. Let's deal with it. Uh, even at our house, you know, things break, the brand new roof leaked. And, you know, I didn't get angry. I just said, okay, let's, let's deal with this. And I, I always say the, the leaders that I admire most, stay neutral in the face of adversity. That when adversity happens, they ask the question, let's gather all the information and what is the best decision I can make today? And that decision might change tomorrow, but there's no um, emotion associated with it. Not that they're, I don't want to equate not having emotion to not being emotional, to, to not, I don't know how to say the words. It just means in 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 the business situation, and even in in relationships, 
if someone is, if I'll use my wife, when she gets really angry at me, it's easy for me to get triggered and get angry back. Yeah. The beauty is to be able to witness it and say, oh my God, I see you're really angry. Um, I'm sorry for what I did that contributed to that. And to acknowledge mm. what that specific action was versus to just respond with the anger. Mm -hmm. And I think in business, there are constant triggers, but to be able to say, okay, I see that is a trigger. I see you're very upset. What can I do? A, a classic example would be a client called me up that was so frustrated with the consultant. And I recommended the consultant and you're screwing up the project. He's letting me down. Um, and my first response was, I hear you. I hear how frustrated you are. I completely agree that he let you down. Give me a day. Let me see what I can learn from this. And I'll get back to you with some, some options rather than mm -hmm. being defensive. No, it's not his fault. You're being unrealistic. Just acknowledging. I hear you. I, I hear your frustration because anyone's emotion is true. There's never, you can never negate someone's emotional outbursts because that's mm -hmm. true to them where they are. So I hear you. I hear, I can see how upset you are, um, but not to be triggered back, not to get defensive. And it's the ability to stay neutral in the face of adversity is brilliant. Yeah. And hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Especially well, when it triggers your core values, especially when it triggers some childhood trauma that's mm -hmm. not yet resolved. But as much of this childhood trauma that we can resolve can allow us to not be triggered by that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating, actually. I mean, I know myself with, a, if I look at my own relationship, for example, and there are certain, it's almost like automatic conversations, which I probably should have been able to see happening a mile off. And we're in that conversation, then something's said, and then I go into some kind of automated Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Some, sometimes I watch the words come out of my mouth and you're like, uh-oh, whatever, why, why did you just, and then, and then it keeps on coming and there's this sort of outer body experience of you should need to stop this, but blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it's almost like both of us are now, and now it escalates and it's kind of yeah. like you, you've, you've rehearsed some of that escalation or it's just, it's just a trigger and yeah. being able to yeah. interrupt it and get out of it in the moment is, is yeah, it's the, it's the, the, the sign of a, of a, of a leader and what we should be uh, aspiring towards. Yeah. And part of my coaching is to do three sixties over a situation. I mean, we can't change how one of my clients reacted, mm -hmm. but we can use it as a learning opportunity to look at what might've been a different response. I took mm -hmm. improv class for three years. I loved it. In the first year, every time I would drive home from class, I'm replaying, oh my God, I could have said that, I could have said that, I could have said that. And you know, after you practice and you look back, you just become more natural in the moment to be in alignment with the person you want to be mm -hmm. and to be present. And well, I, I love improv for the universal truths that it that it practices. You know, the number one is be present, be in the gray space. Yeah. Support your partners. Uh, yes. And you never negate anything. Yes. And so if a client says something, you know, the, the first response is, um, yes, let me look at that. Or mm -hmm. yes. And I think we can build on it. It's not, no, that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. My partner was brilliant at yes. Ending with clients. What would you recommend or advise for team members? So let's say that you're you're in a team and you've got a a dysfunctional leader, shall we put it, or somebody who's coming at you a lot and you're really feeling kind of, um, you know, you're, you're in a difficult situ situation. How, how do you advise younger members of the team to step into their own accountability and being authentic and kind of, you know, the same sort of advice that we're giving to the leaders of the practice practices here? Would you know, many employees are not blessed with having a leader of a practice who's being coached by Douglas. So what would, what would you suggest or how to I deal with it? I would suggest 
picking your firms, you're interviewing the firm as well as them interviewing you. If you're mm -hmm. in a firm with a leader that's not in alignment with your core values and who you want to be, change firms. If the leader is time and time again not reflecting the vision that you want to see in terms of attitude and mentorship and leadership, there are mm -hmm. a lot of great firms out there. Do your research on the firm you want to work for and go after the firm. Don't feel, um, oh my God, I'm so happy to be to get a job. Define who you are and find a firm that fits that. Beautiful. I, I think it's very hard to change. You know, once again, it's very hard to be a junior person in a firm that doesn't have the leadership that you would like it to have mm -hmm. to expect it to change. Do your I best think... to find the firm that has the leadership that you want. Yeah. And I, and I think this is a, this is a very powerful wake up call actually for a lot of architecture business owners is that, you know, there's a, I hear a lot of complaint around how difficult it is to hire people at the moment. There is career advisors, what they teach at university, even which encourages, um, younger members of a team to, you know, go, go diagonal in their career path and swap jobs every couple of years and, and go somewhere and part of the antidote, if you like, of developing and nurturing talent is being the kind of leader that you're describing, because people can then start to settle down and see something well, far more beneficial to them as human beings, where it's worth them sticking around. Yes. And, and, and speaking to that specifically, all firm owners should be able to clearly demonstrate a path forward within their organization. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the steps that a person from a junior to an associate partner can, what are those steps to get to partnership and being very clear on what that looks like? I like that. Love that. Yeah. Amazing. Douglas, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Enlightening as always. Thank you so much for your time and expertise and contributions. You know how much I enjoy speaking with you. Thank you as well. It flies by. And that's a wrap. The Business of Architecture podcast would not be possible without you tuning in, listening, contributing to the conversation, and sharing this podcast. So I want to give a special shout out to those listeners who left a review on iTunes. Thank you so much. First up, we have Dad Patchko. We have Mooski Cat. Iowa Doc 77, Mystery Design, B Hubble, Me to Earth, Ryan at SWSLA, and Myrtle B and Me. Thank you so much for supporting the Business of Architecture podcast and taking a stand for wealthy and profitable architects. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.